Welcome to this new lecture of Robotics 2. This will be our last lecture of this academic year, and it will be devoted to the topic of human-robot coexistence and collaboration. This is a very important and hot topic, both in industry and in service, because human uh, and robots will get closer and closer as they collaborate in executing uh, complex tasks. I will uh, start with uh, a conventional point of view. So the traditional robotics uh, was uh, uh, the one in which robots were replacing human and uh, typically on the factory floor. Now we are talking since uh, a few years about a new different type of robotics, namely human friendly robotics, where uh, robot will collaborate with humans, uh, both on the factory floors and the name that they are given would be co-workers, so working together cooperatively with uh, the humans, or also personal robot in service application at home, in hospital, and so on. Uh, this would mean that uh, there is a, a proximity that is being planned between uh, humans and robots, physically and cognitive, and we have to consider a number of things uh, in order that this may happen in a safe and consistent way. Uh, the results that I'm presenting are most uh, research-oriented, uh, developed over a uh, number of years through European projects, first friends, as I already mentioned, and mainly the Safari project that we coordinated as uh, Sapienza University of Rome between 2011 and 2015. And as you can see uh, from the partner and the main topics, uh, we try to cover all uh, aspects which are important uh, in the interaction, in particular the physical interaction between humans and robots. Uh, covering the aspect, the paramount important aspect of safety, but also uh, an intuitive way of uh, communicating with robots. Uh, revisiting um, most parts uh, of robotics, starting from the mechanical part, the mechatronic designs, the inclusion of compliance, lightweight design of robot, to the uh, generation of plans, which take into account or put into the center the human in the present uh, and is present in the workspace. Um, we uh, revisited also uh, the idea of reactive control, so reacting to uh, sensor information in a very dynamic and changing and unpredictable environment. So we need sensor for doing real-time perception we have to learn from human and interpret what human are doing uh, in, in much the same way as uh, human should understand what the robot is planning to do. And uh, last but not least, uh, controlling the interaction, the physical interaction. Uh, in this lecture, I will cover essentially these two topics. So real-time perception, namely the way that using sensor for monitoring uh, the workspace in which the robot uh, operates and understanding relative distance with uh, uh, other agents, in particular human. And then interaction control, in particular physical interaction control, so the possibility of exchanging, controlling exchanging forces in a safe way between the robot and the human. So in our uh, uh, plan uh, of lecture, we have seen uh, uh, a first basic block of uh, this hierarchy of uh, behavior. And in all cases, um, we formulate control problems which are strictly related to safety. So we have seen that we were able, without the use of external sensing, so using only proprioceptive devices which are on board of the robot, to detect and even isolate uh, collision. Uh, so unintended contacts between the human and the robot. And also we have seen a number of reactions, uh, reaction which, which were mainly intended to uh, abandon the area of uh, contact, 
possibly keeping, uh, continue to keep the robotic task uh, in operation if this is safe enough. Now, the next step, or if you wish, the previous step, would be to avoid this type of uh, collision or unintended, con unintended contact, um, which would mean that uh, we need now sensor for monitoring the workspace continuously and uh, let the robot uh, react to vicinity, not just contact, which is the last uh, say the, the last uh, moment of this uh, interaction. So uh, avoiding collision uh, while doing the task or abandoning the task for a while and then resuming the task as soon as uh, the danger is passed. The danger is uh, considered to be the human too close to the robot um, motion. Indeed, uh, in this case, there will be no exchange of forces no contact at all if something goes wrong and we have a collision then the detection uh, level will um, intervene but of course there are other situations in which we would like to uh, enter in contact with the with the with the robot because we would like to collaborate physically for instance carrying together a load so uh, we have to estimate what are the forces at the contact, these are intentional forces which are exchanged, and we may uh, wish to use a force or sensor or even proceed like in the first problem that we have seen without the use of any other sensor devoted to this purpose. Of course, we may use uh, whatever we have developed for monitoring the uh, workspace, so proximity sensing, uh, together with uh, signal that we can generate in response to a, a collision, so to detect a collision, we may combine this two, and in fact we will combine these two types of um, information in order to achieve this goal of uh, physical human-robot collaboration. Now, uh, a few years ago we set up uh, a control architecture that tried to capture all the robot behavior which are relevant uh, for this problem in a consistent way. So uh, the solution to the problem goes indeed through uh, a design, an integrated design and a combined use of several components from hardware to software. So soft mechanics, which mean compliant lightweight arm, actuation, which may also be compliant and uh, uh, variable according to the type of task that the robot should do together with the human. And of course, extensive use of sensing, proprioceptive and exteroceptive, communication between robot and human or between robot and robot. And indeed, uh, um, everything is being um, orchestrated by control algorithms. So um, we decided that three level were satisfactory to address the problem. The inner level, uh, level or the lower level if you wish, uh, is safety. The second, uh, we call it coexistence. And finally, collaboration. We will see now in detail each of this level, uh, what, what is devoted to and how they interact. So first of all, uh, the always active level is the safety level. In fact, this is the most important feature that a robot should possess in order to be uh, to work together with humans. Uh, the classical solution that has been adopted in the factory floor was using cages or uh, protecting the human from uh, any movement and operation of the robot. So when the robot is in action, the human is not there. When the human is there for programming or maintaining the robotic system, the robotic system is switched off. So um, these, of course, are not appropriate solution for physical human-robot interaction in the sense that we uh, foresee to have. So safety uh, should be guaranteed uh, in in different way. And one way, for instance, is uh, to use a, a collision detection method, which are reliable and practical and on board, like we have seen. Uh, 
Together with this, indeed, uh, the design of uh, lightweight arms, uh, compliance at robot joints, and probably also some software uh, parallel architecture that guarantee um, continuous operation even in the presence of failure. All this goes into the domain of safety. Um, you should think that uh, because of the relevance of safety in, uh, on the workplace, there has been a number of standards that have been devoted to safety and in particular to safety of robots. The most famous one is the ISO 10218, which was developed in 2011 and then updated later on. We'll say more about this uh, standard uh, in a few moments. So this is the uh, ground layer of our architecture. So safety should be always on. Now, indeed, um, the next level is coexistence. So for us, coexistence means the capability of the robot to share its own workspace with other robots, with other entities, but most relevant with humans. So for instance, uh, in the two sequence of uh, snapshots that you see in this slide, um, you may have a robot which is doing his original task, so moving around, uh, doing some pick and place and operation, and all of a sudden the human intervenes because it does something in parallel with the robot. So coexistence means that there is no need of exchange of forces, mm? um, so no need of physical contact. So uh, the robot should continue to do its operation while the human is present. Of course, abandon the operation if the human enters or comes too close to the robot and then uh, recover operation. Now, this is coexistence. Indeed, if something goes wrong, because the human may uh, do a, a very fast motion, which the robot or the robot sensing is not able to capture, so there could be a collision or a contact. So the safety layer, um, comes into place, and this is why we call the interaction between the coexistence level and the safety level safe coexistence. So safe is always uh, there. And we will see some nice uh, video demonstrating what we do mean by uh, um, safety and coexistence, and even uh, more with the third layer of collaboration. So, this is uh, the most complex task, uh, collaboration. So it's at the top of this hierarchy. And of course, collaborating should be, again, consistent with the other behavior. So collaborating means uh, having a, um, the robot and the human do typically complex tasks with uh, interaction and coordination. Now, there could be contactless collaboration or and physical collaboration. These two modalities are not mutually exclusive. Uh, by contactless, we mean, uh, for instance, um, communication by gesture or voice command, or both, or even visual coordination. So the robot is following the human as the human is doing something, or the human is showing something to the robot, and the robot is uh, um, replicating this type of behavior. There is no contact involved, but there is a coordinated motion, so we call this also collaboration. But in fact, we were more interested, in, in particular in the Safari project, in the physical collaboration, which, as I said, uh, involves intentional contact. So we should not avoid contact. We should recognize that human and robot should enter into contact and exchange forces. And of course, this exchange of forces should be controlled. Uh, by the way, there is no a priori specification of where this contact may occur, not necessarily at the level of the end effector of the robot, in much the same way as this interaction may not be done with the human hands, which are the end effector of the human. So the whole body uh, for the robot and for the human should be considered in, in this case. Now, collaboration should proceed, uh, and it's really the most sophisticated uh, aspect of this interaction. But of course, uh, you should still coexist 
with the robot for whatever, what else you are not doing in a collaborative way. For instance, if you're holding an object with your right hand and the, and the robot is uh, uh, in contact with your right hand holding this object, of course, with the rest of your body, you should not get in contact with the robot. So uh, you should still coexist while doing a collaboration. And if something goes wrong, the safety layer is always present to react and stop or escape a dangerous situation. So in this sense, this is a general hierarchy that we developed and we tested, uh, in fact, in all its components over the last few years. And by the way, on different systems. Uh, indeed, collaborative, opera collaborative operations are also um, normed by standard. In particular, the standard uh, ISO 10 to uh, 2018-1, which concerned the single robot and Two, which concerns the robotic system as a whole, and uh, lately refined by a technical specification, uh, the notation with the column and the year, the year stands for the year of publication of the standard or of the technical specification, TS, which is not yet a standard. So the last one is uh, of 2016, is the 15066. So uh, in this context, um, there have been some effort in specifying what should be done, what can be done, what cannot be done, and classify the level of interaction, which are generally, um, generically uh, defined as collaborative operation, even if there is no physical collaboration in the sense that we have just um, mentioned. So the simplest level, the level one, is the so-called safety rated monitor stop. So the fact that the human is entering uh, in the vicinity of the robot and the robot through its external sensors, camera, lasers, uh, proximity sensor, time of flight, whatever you, you name it, uh, recognize this proximity and stops. Okay. Now it doesn't stop in a catastrophic way, catastrophic way, because this type of stop is already, um, let's say, programmed so that the robot may resume its operation from that moment. It's not an alarm stop where you push the red button and, and then you have to restart the system. The next level is the so-called hand guidance. Now, this is an old uh, way of uh, programming the robot, so having the actuators just sustain the weight of the robot and then moving around the end effector with some uh, special handle and uh, letting the robot uh, go to different positions which are then recorded and then repeated in an online operation. So in hand guiding, of course, you are in contact with the robot. The robot is, uh, the supply is on, so the motors are on, at least for sustaining uh, the own weight of the robot itself. So this is a kind of a critical situation, but in fact, the robot will not move unless you're moving it uh, on purpose from the end effect. The third level, uh, it's a refinement of the first one, uh, which means that before stopping, in fact, you can define different areas, different uh, distance between the human and the robot. So in a in the green area, the farthest away, so the robot, uh, the farthest away from the robot, the human is allowed to enter. The robot continues to uh, operate. Probably uh, sets a flag on, so uh, internally check uh, more often uh, the external sensor because of this potential vicinity of the human. Uh, when the human enters in a second region, the yellow one here, uh, typically the speed is going to be reduced. So whatever the robot was doing is uh, now slowing down because, of course, the harm of a potential collision uh, grows with the speed of the robot. Of course, it depends also on the type of tool that the robot is mounting, if it's 
a dangerous tool or not. Even the gripper may be uh, a dangerous tool because it can uh, close uh, around the part of the human body, the hand or so on. So there should be a, a speed reduction. And of course, if you get too close, the robot just stop and wait, just like in level one. And finally, the most interesting part is the level four, where uh, in fact, human and robot are physically co cooperating, collaborating, so they are exchanging forces. And the standard has set some limits to power and force. Uh, in the technical specification, uh, there has been um, a biomechanical study, um, depending on which part of the human body gets in contact with the robot, setting maximum force or pressure limits, depending on the part of the human body, the skull, the arm, the torso, uh, the legs, and so on. Uh, so there is, in any case, a, a limit on the force and on the total power of the robot, which means that if the power is limited, for instance, to 80 Watt, uh, this is a, a, a number that appears in the standard, then of course, whatever will happen, uh, you cannot transfer more than 80 Watt to the human body. So uh, this means that um, 80 Watt are easily uh, surpassed if you have a very massive robot moving even slowly, but if you have a lightweight robot, then you can afford uh, more velocity. And of course, this limitation is uh, in action when you're within the level four. So the, if you're, the robot is uh, not moving, but still using power, uh, there is a limitation to that if you want to satisfy and certify these standards, which means that you can certify and sell your system to a generic user, which is very important. Indeed, at the level of research, we are not yet concerned with that, but if you want to move a product or a, a result from a, a, the research lab to a industry, then we have to comply also with this standard. Now, how this, uh, uh, relates with our uh, three-level architecture, mm, control architecture. So again, here are the four levels of the of the uh, ISO standard. Uh, on the left side, you see also a pyramid which classifies the type of standard. Of course, there are uh, standards which concern generic machine, mechanical machine, electrical machine, and then on top of that, there are specific uh, standard, for instance, for robots. And here you have a, a number of uh, relevant uh, standards uh, in industry and in production. So uh, if you look more carefully, and here on the right hand side, we have our three layers, and I uh, single out some uh, specific tasks that uh, are assigned to each level to the safety we mentioned collision detection and reaction to the coexistence, uh, sharing the workspace, monitoring the workspace with extra sensors uh, with the purpose of collision avoidance, and of course, collaboration, uh, coordinated motion and action with or without contact. In the table on top of this, uh, in the brown table, you see that for each level, there are some specification in the uh, ISO standard, about speed, about uh, separation distance, about maximum torques, about um, controls that should be uh, available to the operator, and uh, how to reduce, uh, so a risk analysis and assessment and a mitigation of the possible risk by uh, special action. Um, and you see that um, I've put some uh, ellipses uh, that relates the various level to our architecture. Indeed, uh, safety goes across all these uh, four levels of collaboration. Our collaboration, so physical or uh, with coordination, is uh, related to the hand guidance, so level two, or to 
the power and force limitation, which is um, uh, level four, while coexistence indeed involves level one and three, so uh, stopping or slowing down and possibly stopping, but still monitoring relative distance between the human and the robot. So we fit into this type of uh, standards, although we develop our uh, control methodologies rather independently from that. Okay, so uh, we have seen uh, dealing with uh, collision uh, detection and isolation that we have defined a collision event pipeline. So if we, for instance, consider the problem of handling collision, we have this type of continuous circle going on. So we plan motion to prevent collisions, but indeed because of the highly dynamic and unpredictable uh, environment because of the presence of humans this uh, plan may even fail so we control the robot the motion of the robot in real time to avoid uh, contact huh? so to escape from possible collisions uh, if this is not achieved for a number of reasons then we should detect that we have had a collision isolate the link that collided and possibly also distinguish if this is a severe collision or not and maybe if it's a soft collision it could be also an intentional contact that the human is searching so by uh, using the contact in order to provide some command for instance the intention to collaborate in any case, uh, once we have classified the type of contact or collision, then we react or replan motion. For instance, if we uh, robot switch mode and it's ready to collaborate from now, from now on. Okay, so this is a continuous circle. Of course, you can restart, plan to prevent, and so on and so on. Now, um, we have seen so far the detection, isolation, and reaction. Uh, not much about distinguishing, although we have seen that uh, we can distinguish uh, soft from hard contact uh, in the closed um, control architecture of the KUKA KR5 uh, by processing filtering, um, high filtering and low pass filtering the motor currents. Uh, but we will see more on that uh, today. So, uh, these are part of the full collision event pipeline that we have already seen uh, with monitor signals that are being generated and information coming from the context. Now, uh, I, I'm showing this um, slide again because I would like to um, put it in perspective with respect to the three layer of our control architecture. So coexistence uh, occurs in the pre-collision phase, in, in fact. So, the, the, the purpose of coexistence is, in fact, not to arrive to a collision to be detected, okay? Indeed, safety, in this case, uh, is really uh, fast recognition, detection, and reaction to this collision, while collaboration may start at the level of reaction. Once we have identified the type of contact, classified if it's intentional light and in fact we can interpret it as the intention to collaborate then our reaction will not be just stopping slowing down or escaping the area of contact but uh, switch or be ready from the point of view of the robot to start to collaborate so this fits uh, puts the collision event pipeline into the context of the uh, our control architecture now just to uh, recall uh, what was the safety part that we de developed from the point of view of software so collision detection and reaction based on residuals so monitoring uh, uh, the total energy or the generalized momentum and this was uh, mainly work done uh, with the previous project the friends project in, uh, also financed by the European community. So um, you, you can see that there are possible reactions, the reflex reaction, 
generating torques which amplify the uh, result from the collision so that the robot uh, flies away from, from, from the area. Uh, the admittance mode was uh, commanding the um, motion, the joint space, uh, proportionally to the amplitude of the residual. And of course, the residual goes to zero as, as soon as the contact is lost. So you see that the reaction in admittance mode is more stiff in a sense, as opposed to the smooth behavior uh, with the reflex torque. Okay, so this is uh, done in a sense. So this is belongs to the layer uh, of safety. So from now on, we will move to the second layer and then the third layer of collaboration. And my presentation will develop the two layer one after the other. So at this point, uh, I would like to show you uh, a couple of videos that um, tell us the story. So the early days, this is a video, uh, informational video um, developed by uh, the National Institute of Occup Occupational Safety and Health of USA in 1989. And then uh, one video coming about 23, uh, years later, it's a commercial video by ABB, it's just a, um, an extract from a longer video, which presents some hardware, the electronic position switch uh, that allows the robot to stop when something goes wrong, and also the software, which is the safe move software, which implement some of the idea which were presented also in the safety standard ISO uh, 10280. Now I have to uh, switch to a different modality now. So uh, please uh, comply with me. So the uh, video uh, have also some audio. So I will not say anything uh, during the um, projection of the videos. Robots, Robots have brought have about, about more productive, productive manufacturing, manufacturing lines and greater quality assurance. Their use has saved people from having to work in hot, toxic, or otherwise dangerous environments. Automated production lines using robots are chalking up an admirable safety record. However, industrial robots have injured people, and injuries may occur more frequently as the number of working robots increases. In at least one case in 1984, a worker was killed. The victim entered the working range of the robot, presumably to clean up scrap metal that had accumulated on the floor. The work cell control systems did not sense his presence, and as a result, the worker was pinned between the back end of the robot and the steel safety pole. His heart stopped. No matter how automated a manufacturing line is, there are sure to be workers around who must be protected. Line operators. Maintenance workers, programmers, managers, and visitors. Robots have weak sensing capabilities, so they can't be relied upon to always react in a safe way when these workers approach. Safeguarding robots is more complex than safeguarding other types of machines. Their range of movement is much greater than other machines. Machine guards around belts, other moving parts, and points of operation are small in comparison to robotic work cells that often encompass several cubic yards on the plant floor. Robot guarding has to be flexible, too, to adapt to the variety of tasks a single robot may perform. So, uh, as you have heard, uh, there was a a big concern about potential uh, of uh, injuries, of uh, uh, incidents that could happen on the factory floor. And one reason for that was that the robots uh, had low sensing capabilities. And this, of course, has dramatically changed in between. But just to understand where we were coming from. Now, the next video, uh, as I said, it's 23 years later, 
and we'll show uh, some uh, commercial product by ABB Robotics. With the function EPS, electronic position switch, the conventional limit switches used to restrict the working range of the robot are fully replaced by a software function. If, for example, due to a programming error, the robot attempts to access a forbidden access zone, it will be switched off by the safety controller. The interaction between a worker and a robot such as for manually loading a gripper with a workpiece, becomes possible with the safe move function. With safe move, the safety controller supervises the safe standstill of the robot during the time the worker is within the hazardous zone. Furthermore, safe move allows limiting the robot movement to predefined zones in the space in order to enable safe coexistence of human and robot. It also allows restricting the traveling velocity of the robot to a preset value. To enable humans and robots to optimally complement one another while carrying out manufacturing tasks together, it is necessary that the position of the worker is spatially detected in a safe manner at all times. In principle, this can be achieved, for example, through camera systems which constantly monitor the workspace of the robot and the position of the worker and continuously transmit this information to the control system. If robot and human approach one another, the control system can then first reduce the velocity of the robot until it finally switches the robot off completely in case the distance between worker and robot falls below a preset distance. This method allows safe implementation of new semi-automated manufacturing strategies that were not possible up to now. Okay, so uh, as you have heard, uh, about eight years ago, uh, again, still in the... Um, manufacturing um, area of AVB, they were starting uh, developing this uh, safe, mode so safe move software. Now things have progressed in between, but uh, you may have recognized that uh, the speaker mentioned uh, a couple of aspects, so slowing down motion, stopping the motion. Uh, everything is um, controlled by a monitor of the workspace, in particular they were using a uh, laser scanner in, in this context. You have seen a laser scanner in front of the window which uh, was open when the human uh, brought in a part and wrote the logo of ABB and uh, uh, on, on a table which was supported by the uh, robot. And in all other operations there is always a camera or um, laser or proximity sensor uh, monitoring distances. So uh, things have uh, developed and in fact in 2016 ABB uh, has uh, issued uh, the um, Safe Move 2 which is certified. So this is a, a demo on an on a, uh, exposition in Singapore in November 2016 uh, which is simpler than the one that we've seen before. There is no, uh, no audio so I can run it right now so this is i would say today's operation so this is uh, an abb is uh, white uh, it's not orange and this just for the matter of representation shows the area that are being monitored you see at the base of the robot there are two laser scanner the yellow boxes right and left so when the human enters the slow area it reduces its own motion when it enters the stop area for instance for inspecting the uh, end effector content, uh, the robot stops completely, then restarts because uh, you are in the slow area and when you're out of this you're completely off. Okay, so quite about the same time uh, in uh, Safari and in, uh, previously in, in France, uh, we developed uh, our architecture 
And in fact, we have uh, here a summarizing video, which uh, it's a three minute video. So again, with audio, I will uh, uh, stay calm for these three minutes, which shows our concept. And you will see that our concept, especially for testing distances uh, between the human and the robot, uh, is much more flexible. Okay, so it allows the human to get much closer, still in safety condition, to the uh, to the robot. There's a difference because because um, we use here a lightweight robot by KUKA, not an industrial one. Uh, but uh, apart from that, uh, the operative conditions are quite similar. Uh, in the video of, by ABB, they were using two laser scanner. We are using here just one Kinect depth sensor, which is, by the way, a very cheap one. But indeed, uh, our solution is, has not yet been certified uh, by the uh, institution which are devoted to this. So it cannot be moved directly to an uh, industrial setting uh, without this certification. But this may, may be done. It's something that we are not particularly interested to do personally, but there are some transfer activity of this type of stuff. So next video is safe physical human robot collaboration and it dates 2013. Within the FP7 European Project Safari, we have proposed a framework for physical collaboration between humans and robots that goes beyond conventional solutions for preserving safety. Safety is the most important feature for robots working close to humans. Coexistence is the robot capability of sharing its workspace with other entities. Collaboration occurs when the robot performs a complex task with a direct human interaction and coordination. Safety is guaranteed by a collision avoidance method based on a depth sensor, a Kinect. Points of interest on the robots are projected in the depth image, where robots to obstacle distances are computed in a fast way, taking into account also obstacle occlusion. Collision avoidance is performed in real time. Besides checking the human pose, also static or moving obstacles are detected, checked and avoided. Multiple obstacles are avoided as well. Except for the end effector, all other robot points of interest will treat obstacles as geometric constraints in the Cartesian space. A collaboration phase is started by the user with a simple gesture. Contact points are localized using the depth sensor. This geometric information is collected together with the joint torques resulting from the contact, as obtained by our residual based estimator. Combining this data allows an estimation of the exchange of forces at the contact point, those used by the human for guiding the robot. The user requests to end the collaboration phase by pushing on the robot and the factory. Safe coexistence is guaranteed. Only the designated collaborating hand is allowed to get in contact with the robot and the factory. All other entities are still considered as obstacles. Okay, so um, apart from the music, which is uh, horrible, but was free, uh, you have seen all the uh, development that we have made, uh, in particular uh, by 
measuring distances between the robot and the human and we use a, a depth space approach and now I'll show you how this works which allows to get very close to the human in fact between the human and the robot before stopping the robot or moving it away. Uh, the second part instead is more uh, devoted to collaboration. It's, this was our first attempt to do collaboration only at the end effector level and you have seen what I called uh, co consistency between collaboration and coexistence. At some point Fabrizio, Fabrizio Flacco was the person in the video, um, is uh, holding the end effector and moving it against its other, uh, his other arm. So because collaboration uh, was in action, the robot was following uh, at the end effector level the human hand. But since coexistence is more important for the other part, then uh, trying to bring the robot against his other arm uh, made the robot very stiff so that uh, Fabrizio could not really bring it in contact. So at this stage you have a, a safe collaboration or a coexisting collaboration because uh, the two levels have interacted in this way. Okay, so uh, let's move on and consider the problem of collision and avoidance. Of course, uh, we need to have extraceptive sensor monitoring the workspace and there could be a, a large variety of sensors. In fact, uh, for instance, laser scanner that uh, were used uh, mostly for navigation in robotics. Uh, now the main target is uh, to provide information on human to robot distances in safety cells. Uh, you can have a stereo vision, you can have single camera, multiple camera, Kinect, depth sensors, um, presence sensor or structured light. So you can combine um, a variety of sensor, of also of different uh, cost indeed. And one main, main, main problem is where to put the sensor uh, around the, the cell. So you should uh, try to minimize areas which are not covered by any sensor. Indeed, uh, you don't, don't want to use a, a large number of them. So you have an optimization problem, which takes into account also the probability that the human will stay in some area around the robot. For instance, if most of the time the human will be in front of the robot and not on, uh, on its back, then it's, it is clear that our sensor will be more pointing this area rather than the other. So uh, this type of uh, um, intuitive idea can be formalized into a, an optimization problem that decides where to put the sensor. For instance, in the central figure, you see two uh, half circle and uh, you parameterize the position of uh, a depth and a present sensor. And then you find the optimal location based on some probability distribution of where the human and the robot will uh, operate the most. So uh, we decided to use uh, uh, the depth information. Um, depth information are coming from a, a so-called RGBD sensor, so camera, which are equipped also with uh, an extra um, laser information, which allows to reconstruct also the depth and to associate to each pixel of the image also uh, a depth of the object which are being seen. So here in this uh, typical image in yellow and black. Uh, the lighter is the color of a pixel, the closer is the object. So objects which are far away are pretty much dark. Now, once you have collected this image, how to use it in order to understand relative distances between a moving robot and object in the environment, which may be either static or moving, or moving like a human, okay? And there, are been, there have been over the years a number of approaches working in the configuration space of the robot, which is the typical uh, motion planning uh, space that are, is being used. You will hear about this more in the uh, course of uh, Autonomous and Mobile Robotics by Professor Oriola. 
or directly in the Cartesian space, which makes sense, especially if you want to reconstruct the environment. But in fact, we don't want to reconstruct the environment, the 3D environment. We just need to compute distance, huh? very quick, very fast, and very reliable. And this is why we opted to work directly in the depth space, so in the space of the sensor itself. But before moving to the depth space, what, what it is and how it's being used, let's see what are the other options. So let's start with uh, uh, working the Cartesian space. And again, here we have a video uh, developed uh, at the Technical University of Munich, uh, which describe uh, the use of camera or uh, depth sensors uh, with multiple field of views and reconstruction in the Cartesian space of object. Now you see the human hand being uh, uh, mapped and associated to this, uh, you will build a, 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 an object, a geometric object, which will be used for making computation. But indeed you are reconstructing, in fact, all the objects in the 3D space. And here is how it works. Uh, you see on the left the image. So one very important stuff is that the robot is being removed from the picture. Otherwise, uh, it would be considered an obstacle itself and it, it would always auto-collide in, in the sense that it would be closest to uh, its own body and so there would be a dangerous situation. So this object, uh, the, this robot is being removed from the uh, image. All the other objects are being perceived by the sensing devices. Uh, indeed, there will be some uh, 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 gray area. Uh, you will cluster obstacle, but at the end, you will like to reconstruct, in fact, uh, 3D object in the Cartesian space. And from there on, you can plan motion or react to motion. And here is a, a demo with uh, the Kinect overlooking uh, the scene, and you see on the back the reconstruction of the 3D environment of uh, uh, human uh, puppets, I would say. And of course, the robot, who's not moving, will retract as soon as uh, you get close to it. So this was uh, an approach that uh, was pursued, pursued for, for a while, uh, but then um, uh, outperformed by other methods. Now, configuration space is the more traditional way. This is a very old video developed at the University of Pisa, and, and it's typically applied only uh, if you have very few degrees of freedom. So here uh, you have a stereo camera, you can see it on the left, uh, overlooking uh, the motion of this uh, soft arm. Uh, and this is described uh, visually uh, the uh, operation that are being done in order to construct a representation of the obstacle, a human arm here, and of the robot in the configuration space. So there's a matching of features. And from there, you can build a depth map from the stereo image so that at this point, uh, you have an information about all the objects which are present in the field of view of the camera. Now, indeed, uh, when you move the robot, you know at every time uh, which is it com its configuration. Uh, you have a geometric CAD of the model, uh, model of the robot so you can do computation of what part of the configuration space is being covered. And now finally, you construct the so-called C obstacle, so the image of obstacle in the C space. And in the C space, the robot becomes just the point and you can plan a path which avoids collision. Uh, you can see it in red in this 3D view. Of course, this can be visualized if you have three degrees of freedom, so three-dimensional configuration space. For higher dimension, uh, things uh, 
can be done, but becomes computationally very intensive and not visualizable. And here you see the final results is the, the robot uh, getting around the obstacle. Now, of course, uh, this is being uh, done in real time, but you have seen the whole process detailed in this uh, video. And finally, the depth space. So we adopted this one because it is uh, very convenient, very fast, uh, and very reliable. So the depth space is a so-called 2.5 dimensional space because it lives on the image plane. So we have each pixel in the image plane is associated to points on, along a ray which pass through the optical center of the lens. Uh, but Together with this, there's a, a third information, uh, which is the depth of the point uh, with respect to the image plane. So along each ray, uh, you can tell uh, that Cartesian point, uh, how it projects into one pixel of the image, and what is its distance from the image plane. So if you have a, a Cartesian uh, uh, point in a reference frame which some coordinate then you have to transform it into the uh, coordinate frame of the sensor which has a z-axis along the axis uh, uh, focal axis of the of the camera uh, and uh, you can give the coordinate of this point in the depth space by associating the uh, uh, two point P, Px and Py on the image plane with the depth, which is the extra information provided by the depth sensor. So it, it is, in fact, almost a 3D information, but it's associated to each pixel of the image. Yeah? And it's, it's a distance in terms of um, this pixel from the object along each ray coming out of the camera itself. Indeed, here you can see uh, the projection, you can see the actual uh, environment, there's a human, there's a, a KUKA lightweight robot, and there are rays covering in gray beyond this object, because indeed, beyond what you see from the camera uh, or from the depth sensor, uh, you don't know what there is. So these are gray areas that are uh, potentially full of obstacle if you want to be conservative or maybe completely free. Now, once you have this depth space, uh, you can start computing distances. Uh, distances between the robot body and whatever is present in the surrounding. Now, in order to make things efficiently, one associate a number of points of interest on the robot. For instance, in the KUKA that you see on the bottom picture, there were eight points of interest selected along the structure, including uh, the last point at the tip. And around these points, there are area, region, which we uh, monitor for presence of uh, obstacles, which means that uh, with our Kinect, so the depth sensor that we have used, we are uh, looking at the distances uh, of the depth of points which are in the surveillance area for each of these points of interest. And then we can compute the distance in a rather conservative way. So we uh, elaborate these three components, uh, one in the depth space, so the first two are distances in the xy direction, the third is a depth distance, so the distance of the object with respect, uh, the depth of the object uh, minus the depth of the point of interest. Remember that uh, we know where the point of interest are because we know the kinematics of the robot, we get information from the encoder, so we know at every time where are these points on the robot. Uh, on the other hand, so we can associate to them uh, uh, a depth value uh, or let's say uh, a representation in the depth space so three uh, values px py and dp uh, the obstacle point instead is being detected 
uh, on the region of interest uh, by the sensor. And again, it is represented by OX, OY, uh, so the position on the image plane and a depth V0. So from there, you can compute the distance like uh, an Euclidean distance. The only uh, point of um, notable point, I would say, is what happened if the depth of the obstacle point is less than the depth of the point of interest. So in the image on the left side of this slide, when the first point is closer, then of course, all the things that are lie on the line uh, beyond this point are in the gray area. So we don't know if there is uh, something or if this is free. So in order to be conservative, we assume that everything will be full. So if the depth of the obstacle point is smaller than the depth of the point of interest, then in computing the distance, we will replace to the depth of the obstacle point the depth of the point itself, so that we will bring to zero the VZ component, and so the distance will be uh, certainly less than that. If the reverse is true, then we will compute the distance in the regular way. Okay, so with this simple rule, uh, we can immediately have an idea of the closeness of the obstacle point from each point of interest. Now, once we have this type of distance, then we can apply uh, a standard method, which is a repulsive method. Uh, so it is based on uh, a version of artificial potential so that um, the motion of the robot will be uh, pushed away from the closest obstacle. And in order to do this, uh, once we have a distance vector between a point of interest, so we are considering a single point of interest now and a single object. So we have a distance, dpo, and we will move in the direction of this distance, which is a vector. So we normalize this vector to characterize the distance. So we divide d by the norm of d itself, and we add a scalar to uh, define the intensity by which we will move away uh, the point of interest from, the from this uh, obstacle. Uh, and there's a function that uh, modulates this repulsion. Of course, it's maximum when we are very close to zero and then goes to zero when the distance is far enough. So we can detect that there's a point there, but it's far enough not to let the robot have any uh, repulsive reaction. Now, in order to uh, improve the behavior of this uh, repulsion and to avoid some zigzagging operation or continuous switching between closest obstacle, now, uh, if we consider for each point of interest all obstacles which are near, so with our, which are in the region of interest uh, of this uh, control point, so for each of them, we compute uh, the repulsive vector. Now, the total, uh, the direction that of the resulting motion will be the sum of all repulsive vector. So we are averaging, in fact, the repulsing of each point so that we don't have discontinuities. Because if you have one point being the closest and giving also the direction of repulsion, and while moving, another point becomes the closest and gives a different direction, then you will typically switch from one to the other and have a, a jerky behavior for the robot. If you consider all obstacles at the same time, you have a much smoother behavior. Indeed, the magnitude, however, is given by the nearest obstacle only. So the most dangerous obstacle gives also the magnitude of the repulsion, while the direction is the an average of all obstacles. Of course, if there's only one obstacle, then uh, magnitude and orientation are given uh, by this single obstacle point. Uh, there are also situations where we need to avoid a very fast obstacle getting uh, toward the robot, for instance, a human progressing against the robot itself, 
So we need some other strategy for avoiding the so-called local minima of artificial potential. And one of these strategies is the pivoting strategy that I'll show you next. But before doing that, uh, there are two videos here that uh, illustrate the behavior of this uh, construction. So um, the construction of the distance and generation of a repulsive vector and handling of multiple uh, obstacles close to the point of interest in order to see what happens. The first video uh, here on the left shows uh, a red point, uh, which is the point of interest. While Fabrizio is bringing its hand closer to it, or multiple hand, and you see the green and blue lines are the single repulsion. And here you see the same story in the depth space. And you can see how uh, you can combine uh, repulsion to get a common one. Now this uh, is obstacles moving around a fixed point of interest. Now this fixed point of interest now is placed outside the robot, but in fact, in general, is one of the points of the robot and moves together with the robot. Now the second video shows instead uh, the point of interest moving, still not on the robot. You see that now it's getting closer to the table and uh, you see that the repulsion, uh, both the intensity and the direction, and now is moving around and now getting closer to the robot itself. So feeling points of the robot has been obstacle. So now you're moving in the depth space this point. So you, you're moving the point in the Cartesian space, but this is the view from the depth space and the computation, as I said, are made all in the depth space. So we are representing it uh, also in the depth space. Now it's getting down to the table. Uh, it will feel some uh, surface first, move close to a, an obstacle, place on the table, and this is the view on the table, and so on. So you think uh, this is just a qualitative, of course, you, you don't have numbers here. But just to say, just to uh, support the idea that this mixed combination is in fact very effective. So uh, there are situations where um, just repulse, repulsion is not enough, especially if the obstacle now represented by a, a disk, a red disk, uh, moves faster and against uh, one of the point of interest. Uh, one of the control points uh, of the robot. So what happens? If you just uh, go away in the direction of the minimum distance, uh, the following situation will occur. And the obstacle, which is faster, will hit the point of interest. So the idea is very simple. Instead of just going in the repulsive direction, you look at the velocity, the relative velocity of the obstacle, and then you try to escape by imposing a rotation, a pivoting uh, around the variation of velocity. So you avoid, in fact, the obstacle in this way. Of course, you can combine and you can generate uh, even other method. Here below, you see the behavior uh, with the modification of the, the variation of the repulsive vector. So to uh, circumvent in the sense pivot around the uh, obstacle coming against the uh, robot point. Uh, and here, uh, if you're interested, I also recorded a very short code doing this pivoting operation. I will leave this uh, for your reading uh, afterwards. Now, uh, this is, we have considered one control point, one point of interest at the time, but in fact, we will handle differently the end effector, which is indeed more relevant, and to which we have assigned a given task velocity. And in this case, we add the repulsive velocity uh, directly to the original task velocity. So we modify the task. Of course, as soon as uh, there's no repulsion for the end effector, the end effector recover the original velocity. 
Uh, on the other hand, for the other control points, for instance, eight control points here in this picture, and you can add uh, no matter how many control points in this uh, case, um, the repulsive vector will be considered as a Cartesian constraint. So you cannot go in a certain direction. Actually, you should go in the other direction. So it's like having a, uh, an obstacle, uh, a geometric obstacle that prevents you from going in certain direction. Now, this uh, constraint is then mapped into a modification of the limits, the joint range and the joint velocity limits uh, within the uh, algorithm that we have seen already when dealing with redundancy, because here we are typically in a redundant situation. So using the SNS algorithm, the saturation in the null space, uh, we have hard constraint at the joint level. And one of these hard constraints comes from the repulsive vector uh, uh, in the Cartesian space. Uh, finally, before letting this uh, guide the robot motion, uh, we will uh, saturate variation. So we will impose a jerk limited motion so that the robot will behave in a soft manner. And uh, the human reaction to this, the human feeling when the robot is moving more smoothly is a sense of genetic safety. For doing this, we have used uh, sometimes the uh, reflexes software, which modified uh, the command so that impose also higher order limitation to differential quantities like jerk. So this is uh, the overview. Uh, let's look the operation. And this was in fact one of the first video performing uh, this type of coexistence in a safe manner. So the robot is doing some tasks, for instance, it's doing a, the classical hexagon that we have used over and over to represent some generic operation. And now the human interfere with the original task. So the robot escapes, uh, escapes at the end effect level now. And of course, not only for uh, human parts, but whatever obstacle is being sensed. You can see below the depth image and the computation of the distances and of the reaction. And here is a classical pivoting operation when you have multiple obstacles uh, and the robot escapes uh, by pivoting around the center. And now you're considering the whole body. In fact, you can see that there are several control points in the depth image. And uh, so you can avoid collision in this way. Indeed, if a collision occurs, the residual that you have built for this robot, so the signal that you generate in real time while moving the robot itself uh, will jump out of zero, detecting a collision and detecting possibly also which link collided and either stopping the robot or reacting to the collision uh, by abandoning the zone of contact as soon as possible, like in the floating or in the reaction, in the reflex reaction that we have seen before. Uh, this is uh, the same experiment repeated in our lab um, and then developed over the years. Uh, here, there's a parallel uh, simulation in MATLAB while the robot is running. So you can see the actual operation of the robot and the avoidance. You have also the video uh, showing the depth image and the computation of uh, distance and repulsive vector. But on the MATLAB 3D plots on the left hand side, you see a skeleton representing the robot. And also you see how the robot is executing his task, is abandoning his task, again, his task, again, uh, an hexagon in the Cartesian space, and then resuming it as soon as possible. So you see that uh, large avoidance, and now the end effector is going back to the hexagon 
and now multiple obstacle escaping abandoning the hexagon but then resuming it and so on okay so the main difference is this and below you see the computation of the minimum distances from uh, any object to uh, the various uh, control points on the robot Okay, uh, all this was obtained using a single Kinect. Indeed, uh, there are some limitations. So uh, the idea is you can put more sensor, in particular, more Kinects. Uh, now Kinect is, uh, I mean, even the version two is uh, out of the market, but there are alternative similar system. At, uh, at that time, uh, a Kinect cost less than 100 euros. So it was a very cheap sensor. So you can equip the um, uh, workspace with more than uh, a Kinect, in particular with two Kinect, uh, in order to solve the classical problem. The first problem is that there could be false collision, because if you're um, obscuring the view of the Kinect of the robot, of course, this is considered as uh, a close obstacle, so its depth is associated to the depth of the control point. So it's like that this obstacle is very close to the robot, while in fact it is still far away. If you mount a second camera, and of course you have to calibrate the two systems, uh, one with respect to each other, then you can recognize that this situation is no longer true. So this is the first things that you can uh, problem that you solve, you see that Fabrizio is putting a hand in front of the red Kinect, and the robot is avoiding something, although it is far away. While with two cameras, the robot continues to do exactly what it was doing. And of course, you can do uh, other things with other objects as well. Now, the second problem that uh, is being solved is the fact that uh, beyond the robot, this is a gray area. So if you're approaching uh, with a hand uh, the robot from the back, uh, this is not being seen. And in fact, you can touch the robot and the robot will not escape. On the other hand, with the second camera, you can detect uh, objects that are also beyond this uh, the, the robot as seen from the first uh, Kinect. Um, there could remain some minimum gray areas, but we found that two Kinects were more than enough in order to um, uh, solve these two problems. Now, the point is, if you have two Kinects, you have two depth spaces. So, uh, there's a, uh, you're tempted to bring back the computation in the Cartesian space, because in the Cartesian space, of course, you can reason about vicinity very easily. But then you would give up the very fast performance of the Kinect. As you have seen uh, in the previous video, uh, the algorithm was running around 250 to 300 hertz rate. Uh, so we would like, we wanted to keep this, this uh, fast computation. So in order to do this, uh, we still work in the uh, in the depth space of each camera, we have a, a leading camera, a leading depth sensor, and uh, once we recognize uh, this situation, we look at special points, special pixel, and the depth of special pixel in the second camera. So we need to make a calibration and association of pixel in advance when we place the two Kinect, Kinect, but this can be done offline, so online the computation is uh, eliminated, in fact, so that we can run uh, as fast as with one device. Now, uh, just a comment on this uh, fastness. You may know that these cameras uh, provide 30 frames per second, so 30 hertz. So how can we run at 300 hertz instead if we don't have a new image? Uh, every 10 image, uh, or better say, for 
10 sample, we keep the same image. So while we are re repeating this and while we are claiming that we go faster than the uh, frame rate of the camera. Uh, the reason is that there are two things uh, in operation here. There are moving obstacles, humans, and we can detect where they are only with a frequency of 30 hertz. But the robot is also moving and the distance is the distance between human and the moving robot. And we know the ro where the robot is, in fact, at one kilohertz because uh, the fast research interface of the KUKA lightweight provides encoder data every millisecond. So this information updates the position of the control points so we can recompute the distances with the frozen image for 10 sample. When the new image comes with a 30 hertz frame rate, then we will uh, have the correct value. Otherwise, we have kind of a prediction. So we use this in the, uh, the, the possibility of having two or multiple rates between the control of the robot and the uh, speed of the sensor uh, to get the best of both worlds. And we are running at this rate as shown. So this is not magic. It's just because we have uh, something that runs faster than that. Uh, namely, the data coming from the robot position. Okay, now uh, I would like now to present uh, some latest results of this uh, human robot coexistence that we have implemented in a, a recent project which ended in 2018. It's an H2020 program of the European Community. And uh, it's a project of a factory of the future, so more application oriented, where we try to bring into practice uh, this idea of uh, distance computation and coexistence. Uh, this uh, is a cell that has been built by uh, within the Simplexity project, in particular by a company in Modena and with a uh, great operation of the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia, and with our algorithm for what matters the distance. Uh, inside this cell, there is a huge uh, industrial robot, an ABB IRB 4600, uh, which has also the safe move option integrated. Uh, all the cell is supervised by PLC, uh, and the communication have also a safety channel. Uh, and in fact, they use a protocol which is called ProfiSafe. Uh, the, so with ProfiSafe. Uh, now, the task of this cell is doing abrasive, uh, abrasive finishing or polishing by fluid jets of metallic surface. Now, these operations are very dangerous for a human. So because of the technological process, there's no possibility of doing collaboration. There's no sense at all. But uh, even coexistence, you don't enter the cell uh, during this phase, but there's a, there are other phases which are still relevant and you would like the robot to operate while the human is present. So the human may enter the cell to look at the part being uh, manufactured or being uh, polished to look at the quality of this part, uh, while the robot is holding another device, which is a laser device used for measuring the roughness of the sur surface, so to evaluating the quality of the operation. So in this case, uh, we can implement coexistence, human-robot coexistence. So there's no contact at all. The robot is too large, too heavy, too massive for uh, interacting physically with it but we can be very close to the, uh, to the robot for looking at the object that is being uh, measured. Uh, so during the measuring phase, or we can do visual check. And there are other possibilities of contactless collaboration. We implemented the gesture-based communication, a very simple one, I would say. Now, uh, in order to do this, uh, we mounted two external uh, Kinects to recognize the human gesture, 
from the human which is still outside the cell. And uh, at the beginning, only two internal kinets mounted at the corner, at the top corner of the cabin, as shown in the picture. And with this, we monitor distance. However, uh, this sensor and the whole algorithm are not certified in the sense of safety. So this cell could be a prototype cell, but could not be really used in, in a practical application. So this is why uh, we were asked to include some certified uh, sensor, in particular laser scanner, uh, for monitoring in parallel to the Kinects uh, the environment. And here you see how we place two uh, laser scanners. Uh, this is the model, the Kienz model. They are placed at 50 centimeters from, from the floor at the two corner. And you see on the image on the right, uh, the coverage that they have uh, at this height, so a 50 centimeter of height, of the uh, free part of the cell. Now, uh, if the human is inside uh, the cell, it's being tracked at 50 centimeter of height by this uh, laser scanner. So, uh, indeed, uh, this is not solving the problem. The Kinect are monitoring distance in 3D, while this laser scanner work only on a plane. So I could be with my legs at a certain distance from the table, which is the uh, missing part uh, in this, uh, in the left image, you can see the table in the 3D uh, representation here. On the table, there is the part being uh, manufactured or uh, surface finished. Uh, so you could be uh, far from the table with your legs, but in fact inclined with your trunk and your arms extended so that you're very close to the table where the robot is uh, moving its uh, uh, device. So uh, you see that you should be very conservative when using the, the uh, scanners while the Kinect, as we have seen, can measure distance very accurately in 3D and uh, let you get closer uh, in a reliable way. So uh, the idea to solve this problem was a cascaded solution. I will skip in now the technical details. If you're interested, I can provide some uh, reference to that. So uh, because the cascaded solution, so having uh, the Kinect in operation, monitoring their correct functioning. And when something was going wrong, for instance, the image remains stuck for a while, meaning that there's a communication problem, or there's a lightning that obscured the Kinect, and so um, everything becomes very dark or very light, uh, all this situation, then uh, the parallel working uh, laser uh, come into play, and the decision of uh, slowing down or stopping the robot uh, relies on this certified uh, sensor. Okay. On the other hand, keeping the Kinects in place gives a more flexible sharing of the workspace between the human and the robot. So here, there are other things that uh, should be done. Here you see the uh, picture of the ABB. Um, is carrying uh, an object which is this kind of a box which is the cvs laser measuring device developed by a swedish partner so cws stands for coherent wave scattering so it's a measuring uh, um, method using laser which are able to detect nanometer differences in the rugosity of the surface so you have uh, a CAD model of the robot that you use to uh, uh, eliminate the robot from the depth image, but the robot has now is equipped with other uh, objects. It has cables bringing power and, and, and uh, pressure to the uh, tool or whatever it is. So uh, you have to use all this information in order uh, to have a modified CAD model that you use for subtraction in the depth space. 
and this is represented in the in the image that you see here. So this is just to uh, highlight that there are a number of practical problems. You don't have a naked robot like in the in the lab. Uh, you have other equipment that you should consider. By the way, on the table you see a part which is a metallic part uh, provided by Romagnani Stampi, an Italian company that produces um, metallic parts that are used for printing uh, parts of the, of the car bodies, plastic part of the car bodies. So they should be very accurate and very smooth and clean. Okay, uh, and uh, this is the overall uh, control and communication architecture that we implemented. Around the ABB robot, we have the two Kinect overlooking the 3D space. We have the two ladder scanner scanning at a certain level the uh, free space inside the cell. Uh, there's a host PC that does the computation of uh, from the Kinect data and receiving the joint position of the robot. Uh, all the communication are through the ProfiSafe protocol uh, and eventually uh, goes to the robot controller, which runs also the safe move. So we have uh, an additional part of safety which uh, limits the velocity of the robot as uh, following the commands by the host PC. There are other switches, for instance, uh, on the door state, and everything communicates. Uh, I mean, the orchestration of all uh, events is uh, done by uh, a safety PLC. And you see that uh, if the Kinects are okay, so the information is okay and you're getting too closer, then you slow down the robot. Uh, in fact, if the Kinects are not working properly and the laser scanner are uh, telling that the, that the human is not far away from, from, the, from the robot itself, then you stop the robot. So you have a green light and a red light for doing this. And here I have a, a, a video. Um, this is um, Andrea Carlesimo, one uh, master student who made the thesis within this project. So he's showing uh, uh, what happens when the robot is moving at maximum speed of 10 centimeters per second. Uh, it's a very massive one. And you can see uh, how it goes inside uh, the cell and what happens to the two Kinect images monitoring the cell on the right hand side. In this case, uh, the Kinects are okay, uh, except when uh, one of the two is being obstructed on purpose to show that the second one can recover information anyway. Uh, you don't see the noise, but you see, you see that, uh, Andrea is putting a hand in the vicinity. Now the robot stops completely. And you see that you can move relatively fast. And so the idea is not that the robot is doing its operation, is drilling or, some, or doing something which is very dangerous, but it's carrying the CWS measuring device now you have seen that he obscured one of the of the camera. So he's moving, he's moving the measuring device. So uh, now we have really coexistence. No? And it's looking or um, mimicking uh, the fact that uh, an operator is looking at the part to see if it's like uh, it is expected to be. Probably also touching the, pa the, the part with his hand to feel the uh, surface rugosity. Okay, now let's move. This was for coexistence. I could stop now, but I will uh, continue a few minutes so that we can have a stop in few slides from now. Um, so let's move to the third layer of our architecture, collaboration. And in fact, we have mentioned that collaboration may be contactless or with contact, so physical. And I will present now in this uh, short uh, final part the contactless uh, part. So in contactless, it means that there's no physical interaction, but uh, the robot and the human uh, are exchanging information uh, in different way. 
of direct communication, namely uh, I'm commanding a robot moves or don't move or uh, making a gesture, uh, or uh, more indirect in the sense that I'm looking somewhere uh, and the robot is understanding that if I look somewhere, the robot should do something, okay? So uh, following the eye gaze or the attention, uh, giving attention to the human motion to recognize uh, the action to be done by the robot. Uh, more in general, you can have a visual coordination so that you use vision in order to uh, move at the same time in a coordinate way, not necessarily in the same way, but certainly uh, coordinated between the human and the robot. On the other hand, physical collaboration, there is a contact. And if there is a contact, there is a force involved. And in order to understand what to do, uh, the first thing that we will do is to estimate these contact forces, even without having a local sensor that provides this information. So we will see that we need some form of virtual sensing device. And once you have this contact force, you can use it for any purpose. So you can control the exchange of forces, but also the motion of the contact. So you can apply all the methodology that we have seen uh, for controlling robots interacting with the environment. The only difference is that the environment now is a very dynamic one, is a human, is neither soft nor infinitely stiff, uh, is unpredictable and the geometry is very variable. So we have to adapt to this situation uh, in a very reactive way. Okay, so this as a premise. Now let's uh, say a few uh, words and, and give some simple example of contactless collaboration. So uh, first of all, uh, you can use uh, your hands, your head, your whole body. So different body parts to make gestures. The Kinect itself is able to recognize hand waving, which is the most simple operation. Uh, this is already, uh, let's say, inside the software of the Kinect, together with the creation of a skeleton or human body, so that you can, follow, since the Kinect was used for video games, uh, it can reconstruct the skeleton of up to four or five person in the version two of the Kinect. So together with this recognition, it comes also the recognition of some uh, simple gesture by hands. But indeed you can uh, set up a vocabulary of um, gesture and it is important to recognize this in order to uh, the robot to um, make the associated operation. Or you can give a, a voice command, there are very, freeware uh, speech recognizer. So you recognize voice command and then uh, the robot will uh, start the collaboration and do something without contact, but collaborating with the human. In fact, you can do both things together. You can uh, show the robot something, so do a gesture while commanding something. Huh? So this mixed operation is very interesting. And here is a uh, is an old video, it's uh, one of the first videos which, which we had, where we were using Kinect and the SDK library, which uh, is used for voice recognition. So the, the, the combination, the robot will move uh, accordingly to the command, the voice command of the human and the gesture that the human is doing. Uh, here again, there will be some uh, audio in this video, so I have to uh, switch operation. Coca, listen to me. Give me. Thank you.
Thank you. Okay, stop collaboration. Okay, so uh, you have seen uh, this type of uh, following, motion following. Uh, with different command, the robot goes to where uh, Emanuele here uh, had put the hand, so this is a go-to, or just follow the right hand, the left hand, and you just see just a selection of commands. The most interesting one is follows the nearest hand, the nearest as seen by the uh, Kinect. Here in the video, you see two pictures. One is on the side to show uh, operation, while uh, the picture on the bottom part uh, is the view of the Kinect, which was overlooking from the back of the robot the scene. So uh, we mounted this L-shaped uh, and effector in order to show better uh, the orientation of the and effector. Uh, it is controlled in position only, so there is some redundancy, in fact, for this. And a following means that uh, the nearest end is the nearest hand to the Kinect. So if you, uh, during the video, you have seen that uh, Emanuele has exchanged his uh, hand, so the robot uh, had a change of direction and, and then started to follow the uh, nearest hand to the Kinect. Okay, not the nearest hand to the robot. So this was uh, for clarification. Uh, on the other hand, this, uh, this is another um, situation is in fact in the simplexity cell. As I mentioned, we mounted also two uh, external Kinect 2.0 here uh, in order to recognize some gesture. And here you will see another master student of ours, uh, Beatrice Procoli, who uh, starts uh, some gesture, and you see here the, the code that is she implemented, but in fact uh, could be done uh, uh, other things. Uh, opening or closing one or two hands, there's a first initial phase of activation, and then uh, there's a final gesture also to deactivate. Now, while um, you will see uh, the person uh, with this motion, uh, you will see on the um, in-picture window uh, a skeleton of the human and uh, you will see a, a red or green ball around the, the hands when he has when the kinect has recognized the uh, the gesture and this is then giving a command to the robot to the robot which is moving inside the cell so the gesture have been activated now and now you see both hands are closed or open and the robot uh, starts motion or stop motion or limit the speed. Again, one open, one closed. The limit speed has been uh, uh, taken out and, and the robot has uh, restarted moving. It's a very short video, but just to have an idea of what can be done uh, from the outside to the inside robot. Another possibility of uh, communication and of programming, if you wish, or modify online the programming of the robot. Now, uh, I mentioned that visual coordination is another possibility of uh, collaboration, contactless collaboration. Uh, here we have uh, developed in our lab uh, two types of uh, possible visual coordination. So the idea is either you have a camera mounted on the end effector, so an eye and hand, which follows a human, for instance, the human head or face, uh, so it keeps it always inside the, the line of sight, or vice versa, you have a human which has a camera or um, a Kinect on his head, on his helmet, or as we are doing right now, is uh, using an oculus and uh, from there uh, it provides an inf a, re a relative information with respect to the to the end effector of the robot which follows the uh, human head okay so the the robot there's a relative pointing and relative positioning at the same time now uh, in order to relax uh, the pointing uh, task which requires two degrees of freedom 
while the relative position requires three uh, degrees of freedom, uh, we introduced a cone. Uh, you, you can see it in these images. So that the requirement is that uh, the pointing is either on the surface of the cone, and this is a one-dimensional task, or inside the cone. And this becomes an inequality, which when not active is not it's like not having the task. When it's active, it becomes like before. So you're on the uh, border of the cone. Okay. So uh, in fact, uh, this is very important in order to evaluate how many extra degrees of freedom you have. In our case, the robot is a KUKA lightweight with seven joints. And if you were only interested in position or relative position, so following a path of, or being at a certain position with respect to the human head, this would involve uh, three degrees of freedom. So you have a degree of redundancy equal to four. Uh, if you had specified, like in the original version, position and pointing, you have two more uh, task variable needed for the pointing part. So you uh, go up to five. So you had only a two-dimensional uh, null space available for any other uh, reconfiguration. Uh, indeed, if you're specifying position and orientation in full, you would have a, a six-dimensional task. But in fact, uh, we ended up with a position and a relative angle you know, with respect to the direction of pointing. So this is a relaxation. And we have, in this case, uh, a task. This uh, visual coordination task yeah, has dimension four. So we have three degrees of freedom to be used for uh, exploiting uh, redundancy and, for instance, collision avoidance. Now, uh, this is first a simulation. We use task augmentation method. Uh, here, the camera should uh, trace uh, a circle. So the camera is tracing a circle. Uh, and the pointing direction of the robot with respect to the camera it remains constant. And it should move at a certain distance from the camera. So this is the four-dimensional task. Uh, here you see the, the motion of the, uh, the desired position and also the desired orientation, which remain constant. And the position error in this simulation using our controller uh, was less than 1.5 millimeter, while the pointing error uh, in radians is uh, 6 uh, um, to the 10 to the minus 3. So you see here now uh, somebody is moving the camera and the robot is following at a certain distance, pointing at the camera or approximately pointing at the camera within a, a small cone. Of course, if the camera is now pointing uh, uh, upwards, uh, the, the, the robot is, goes out of workspace. In fact, we built a, a sphere around the robot, which defines the task limits. And when the task cannot be achieved, it, it's being achieved in a least square sense until uh, it can be recovered completely. OK. So this is to give an idea, and the actual implementation is in this uh, following video uh, taken in our lab. Here you can see the parallel simulation in VREP. Uh, here, Khaled, uh, one of our PhD students, was uh, holding uh, the Kinect and moving it around. We specified a certain distance, and the whole task is being reproduced uh, in VREP on the right hand side. You see the blue sphere, which defines the task limit. In fact, the camera is uh, out of the workspace, but uh, the robot is following a projection of the camera on the surface of the sphere. Uh, in this first version, uh, we needed to localize the camera with respect to the robot. Uh, so the Kinect with respect to the robot. And we use this marker placed on the uh, table. Um, when we move to the following situation, which is the one uh, depicted here, so with the Oculus Rift uh, here mounted on a helmet and then mounted completely with uh, augmented reality also included, 
then uh, we didn't need this uh, localization. We used the localization of the Oculus Rift itself. Okay, so uh, let's uh, stop this first part here and resume uh, the second part on physical collaboration next. Thank you for listening.